Hey, 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 welcome to Be Bold Jew. So we are gonna have Steve on here very shortly. He's still on his way, but we didn't want to lose this um, live because it has been shared out. And so we're really looking forward to having Steve with us today. Um, it looks like he's on his way in right now to um, the show. So welcome to Be Bold Jew. Hey, Steve, I'm, I can't quite hear your voice yet, so talk to me. Tell me if I can hear you. So we're going to be working on the tech in the background. Steve can hopefully hear me, um, but I can't hear him yet. So we will work on that. And I'm going to put this up so that you can have something to look at while we're working on that. And here is um, some of the places where Steve's been featured. So I'll be right back. Uh, they're in um, Kentucky and their house, you had to go over this river, which was going over their driveway. It was pretty awesome. Um, I really enjoyed my time there with them. And I'm so excited to bring him to you. And I'm really bummed that the sound is not working. So I'm hoping that they're going to try to find maybe a headset or something and see if we can't get the sound going. Uh, let me try putting it. I'm going to put him up and see if that doesn't bring the sound up. Hey, hey, can I hear you? I think I can, Steve. Can you? Can you? I can. Yay. Phone. Alrighty. Let me. Um, can you switch to Cindy's phone? Yeah. I've got it. Yep, okay. we're good. Okay, how do I? <laughs> how do I go sideways? How do I go backwards? How do I? Oh, okay. So. So welcome to you because I've got all this text in front of my face. There you, you are. You can't see me. You can see me now. I, I can see you. Can you hear me? All right. I can hear you. We can all see you. Hello. Okay. Welcome. And I'm going to show both of us here. Uh, how do I do this? I go here and then, oh, look at that. So I was showing people while we were waiting to get the sound figured out the, um, the picture from your website where it shows the home life and the New York Times and the Herald you, leader. So you've been featured in some pretty amazing places. Um, well. Yeah, you have. This is yeah. a yes. <laughs> we got uh, one of my paintings got the full front page of the New York Times. But that was the same one uh, undefeated. I think it was in uh, hundred at least a hundred newspapers with photos and, and interviews. Um, yeah. And no appointment necessary. Kind of did the same thing, you know, so I don't know. I, it's been a very interesting experience trying to uh, share what I've learned about what God is like um by observing the life of Jesus and, and, uh, you know, a lot of people really like it. So I think that's good. 
I don't know if you see me, but I've got a lovely gray screen. Oh, there you are. <laughs> there I am. Here we are together. Oh, we'll just go this one here. So we're still working out the tech details and how to do this. So I'm seeing your fingers now. Oh, They're lovely. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I touched something and, and all of a sudden I'm there. Okay. All of a sudden you're there. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, I'll make sure that you're being seen. So just trust that you're being seen and smile pretty and you'll be good. So I did have a question for you. Good. good. Yes. Is it personal? Well, you know, well, maybe. So what barriers did you face when you began your career as an artist? I mean, I think some people think it's glorious to be an artist or, you know, like glamorous, but I'm sure it hasn't been glamorous all along the way. Oh, no, no. Um, well, um, you know, when I started in as a professional artist, some of the biggest hurdles I had to overcome were because most of my... Uh, big clients uh, expected me to either be strung out on drugs, be drunk, have absolutely no idea what a budget was, have no respect for deadlines. And so, you know, I show up um, beating deadlines, beating budgets, and and going above and beyond the call of duty every possible chance I could because, uh, you know, art can be a a wonderful profession, but it doesn't get a lot of doesn't get a lot of good press, mostly because there's a time honored tradition that we're starving artists and that uh you know, we're not worth anything till we're dead. And and that still may yet be true, but you know. Well I think I think it's more that you're worth more once you're dead because you and can no I longer create. Right. I mean, so that creation ends and then then those creations become worth more because you can't get any more new ones. It's not fair. I know. It's <laughs> so not fair. Um, I, I haven't. I haven't as long as she outlives me, you know, what do I yeah, There you go. It'll benefit your wife and your children. This is a yeah. good thing. So <laughs> I, kept, uh, I have an I have an artist friend in Vermont who I I believe he's the one doing it. I haven't confirmed this, but. Uh, there's a restaurant there and he would go in and on the back of the paper um, placemats, he would draw a photo and leave it for the next or draw a drawing and leave it for the next person. Well, and it was just, I did that know. a lot, but I didn't leave it for anybody. I took it. <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah. It's both work. So, so you, you do go to a restaurant pub now and make some creations too. Yeah. Is that not true? Uh, Yes, at uh, it's a place called the Woodford Inn, and the pub aspect of it is called Addie's, and they've got a five and a half foot tall by seven foot wide uh, stucco wall that's been painted black with a frame around it, so it kind of looks like a chalkboard, but uh, it's really a rough surface. Not as rough as the brick wall I'm painting on now, however. Uh, and I've been doing... Um, chalk murals and erasing them once a month now for almost seven years. Okay, so seven years ago, taking you back to that very first one that you did, and that first month that you had to go in at the end of the month and erase that very first one. How did you feel? Well, I didn't mind at all because actually uh, Bruce was, the guy that owns the place was erasing them for the first few months and, and then I realized you know he's having all the fun because he doesn't have any, any attachment to it so I started videotaping uh, erasing them and, and you know there would be times when uh, that the the pub would be really full and I'd get up there and start wiping it off and people start yelling at me <laughs> you know um, they thought maybe the help had gone mad or something so uh um, you know, since since almost everything I've got has a sense of permanence to it, it's like I still have every Art for God painting in my possession as the owner, except for one. 
And so to have something that I can create and, and uh, of course, I photograph it, but, you know, to create and destroy, it's actually been pretty liberating. It's not near as panicky as I thought uh, because you know you're going to do it, so you just do it. I've erased some beauties, so I can tell you that. Oh, yeah, there have been somewhere I've watched the video of you erasing it, and I've almost cried. I'm like, no, that's so beautiful. But you do take a photo of it or somehow have oh, yeah. some kind of record of it. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, what was the first painting that you ever sold? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I have no idea. How did you transition then from... I have to go back to high school or something like that, I guess. So did you always know you wanted to be an artist? Uh, I always knew that I was an artist, but I didn't always know that I wanted to be one. Um, well, you know, I mean, I, I grew up in a very uh, high-functioning family. My dad was... Uh, an engineer and a very, very good engineer uh, and a very practical and logical, you know, you know, if I can't add it together and get the correct answer, then it can't possibly be true kind of guy. So the world of gray uh, didn't really exist very well for him. And mom was the creative one. Uh, well, dad was too, but so, I mean, I pursued, uh, my art and in college I went into architecture first and liked that pretty well but but a couple of things happened that made me leave architecture then I went into engineering uh, because I knew I could have a firm given to me if I did that and it was like oh my god this is like the worst thing I've ever done so it's not that it's not great for some people but you know, engineering has some very creative aspects, but it was very difficult for me to feel creative uh, when I was doing road elevations and, you know, and, and stuff that my dad designed. And, you know, as the years have gone by, I've gone uh, across some beautiful interstates in America, you know, Kentucky primarily, where I know he designed the pass through in the mountains and stuff like that. And it's like, Damn, that really is pretty. I mean, it really was creative. It was beautiful. But uh, he always wanted me to uh, do art as a hobby. And uh, So was he supportive of you when you uh, transitioned? Yeah, well, you know, it was... God love him. I mean, just like me as a dad. I'm always doing the best I can, but... The kids might think I'm a complete, uh, you know, that I might be missing the mark because I don't really understand their point of view. And so I know that that uh, Dad only meant the best for me because he couldn't conceive at all how I might make a living as an artist. And, and his vision of what it would be like for me wasn't far from, from, uh, from uh, yeah, he was... It's been a very interesting, wonderful, glorious. I mean, you know, uh, I know what it's like to absolutely live on faith. A lot of people don't. A lot of people have uh, reliable paychecks from one week or one month to the next, and they have no idea what it's like as an adult with family and kids to to actually engage God on a faith level uh or you're completely reliant and at the same time you're busting your can and doing everything you can. So you're not always, uh, presuming on divine mercy and being a lazy bum, which I'm not, but, uh, well, it's been an interesting trip, but you know, uh, my dad was a great man. My mom was a great woman. Uh, and I became an artist kind of in spite of the logic to do other things, I guess. Yes. Well, Ed, 
It, it does make sense. Edgell Groves um, says, hello, good to see you. Who? Edgell Groves? Oh, Edgell. Cool. Yeah, Edgell. Yeah. I guess I didn't say okay. his name wrong. Edgell. Well, yes, he says hello back. Things on the screen and I can. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I can put these things up on the screen. Question, I'm really disappointed. So, what's that? You didn't ask me a difficult personal question yet. Oh, what difficult personal question are you wanting gave, me to ask? No, that's not fair. I gave you a fair warning. Well, see, <laughs> I mean, the, thing about, the thing about when you get a little bit of notoriety and a little bit of fame and 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 you do a fair amount of things well, most people don't let you be human. Most people want you to have a higher standard in all things and be able to pull off life uh better than they do so that you can be some kind of an icon that happens to a lot of preachers and stuff. And I mean, in small irrelevant ways, it happens to me, but you know, I mean, I would rather somebody, uh, you know, know that I'm, I may have accomplished some pretty cool things, but I'm just a total ordinary schmo that just believe well, it's with all my heart and went for it. Well, that's really interesting because I was actually going to go there next. And one of the things that I saw as I was looking through your, um, your work is the humanity that you show in the photos. And I mean, in the drawings and the paintings and uh, even the chalk, chalk drawings. So let's talk about this one that's gone viral. Yeah. Uh, okay. Tell me what you want to know, and I'll tell you everything I know about it. How's that? You know, it attracts some of the most um, beautiful comments and some of the most uh, hate-filled comments. Uh, and, and I guess that means I did the, I did it right. Uh, because there's not a lot of uh, tepid emotions surrounding Calvary. Um, you know, I, I was on a, I've been on a mission for a few decades to try to, um, uh, kind of take Jesus out of the historical box and let him be alive today. Let him be relevant today. Let him function and serve in a way so that people aren't always praying to somebody that died 2,000 years ago, you know? And, uh, the things I've, things I've learned about, uh, Jesus of Nazareth and the way he conducted himself, the way he treated other people, the way he responded to tragedy and suffering because uh, I've been a, a Buddhist, I've worshipped with Hindus, I've been a fashion of a Muslim, I've worshipped with Native Americans, I mean, I, I've kind of been to a bunch of synagogues, I've been to a bunch of different denominations, but the one thing that I learned from Jesus that no one else seemed to be able to inspire me on that level was that this is exactly how God acts when he is in full partnership with a human being. This is what and how we might act in service to others uh, if we're in full partnership with God. And, you know, I mean, there are a, a, a lot of great prophets, but uh, I don't, I, let me change that to a positive. I believe with all my heart that Jesus of Nazareth is God incarnate, was God incarnate, and fully manifested exactly what a human being might act like, sound like, and function like if they were willing to embrace uh, a full partnership with deity and divinity 
um, and not have any self-centered motivation behind any of the good they might do. So, uh, I mean, Calvary, I've met some, met a few ex-junkies in my life. In fact, our uh, wonderful employee in, in Gatlinburg is a, someone who's in recovery. And and she's a, a beautiful woman, and she's living a graceful, beautiful life, doing and struggling like everybody else, whether they've ever been addicted to drugs or not. She's dealing with all the same stuff. But she's doing it with grace because she she embraced partnership with the Creator. And mm. So Calvary was, um, you know, most of the people that had been in heavy addiction uh, thought that they were so despicable that even God would turn their back on them and and I knew that wasn't true uh, and, and what little I know about God from knowing he's been real to me since I was five I still feel like I've got a ice pick scratching on the surface of the world's greatest iceberg trying to figure out all these great things that's why I love Jesus so much because uh doesn't matter how ignorant I am, if I can just remember to have a certain amount of grace and patience and to choose kindness over, you know, self-centered uh, decisions, you know, at least I've got a chance. I know what side I'm on, you know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, there was, and I still haven't connected with him, but I would like to because I want him to you know, embrace what he helped me create by telling me the story of his struggles as a pastor, uh, as an ex-junkie pastor whose congregation was filled with people that he grew up with. They were in different stages of recovery and even told me that one time uh, a guy just couldn't help it. I think it was a guy and he shot up, but he still came to church, you know, and so and I remember him saying, if you could just create a painting that would help me serve these people. And wow. even while he was talking to me, I had a, a very small vision. It was kind of a, in, in the, I guess in the Orient, they call it a mandala. It was a circular image. I saw uh, the junkie shooting up. But the junkie didn't realize that his arm and Jesus' arm were the same arm because he didn't understand that God indwells us. Uh, sometimes God indwells us as a, a beautiful resort. Sometimes God indwells us as a prisoner in a horrible prison. But nevertheless, um, in the Bible it says, uh, however the real quote is, it says, in all of your afflictions I am also afflicted and I will never leave you or forsake you. And and I wanted the people that had made some unfortunate decisions in their life, whether they'd been tricked into it, forced into it, or just cavalierly said, I can do this shit and it won't bother me. Or because they were in such desperate pain, they would do anything to get out of it. I just wanted them to know that God was still with them that uh i mean that's the god i adore that's the god i say hello to every day and uh sometimes i say hello to god and say you know sorry i really screwed up yesterday let's talk about it or i go man yesterday was awesome i got to serve some really really neat people and but i know this i know service is sacred i know it's sacred it's not it's like uh, wherever it is in the Bible, they talk about the first mile of service. And Jesus talks about the second mile of service. That's where God hangs out. I mean, yeah. he might have a pair of binoculars on the first mile of service. But if you want to hang out where God is, you, you, you live and trust and believe that 
your commitment is to function in the second mile of service. I mean, that's where all the good stuff happens, you know? Uh, your whole family really embodies that. I just want you to know that. Your whole family embodies that. You and all your wife and your children. Well, you yeah. And, wife and your children. They all embody that. I think all the kids are pretty awesome, too. Yeah, the boldness in your family is amazing. Well, they must take oh. it out. <laughs> so when I look when I look at your paintings, I see boldness throughout all of them. So well, what does it mean to live boldly to you? Uh well, interesting. Uh well a couple of things came to mind. One is uh, and this is predicated on understanding what it feels like to live on faith, but there are a lot of people that are that have a comfort zone that denies them the privilege of realizing that the unknown is one of their greatest allies, one of their greatest potential possibilities to grow uh, exponentially and to grow geometrically uh, as a child of God. Um, and I, I guess boldness just means, you know, loving the unknown too. It's like, I don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next, but, but I try to prepare myself every day for a significant, uh, for a significant, uh, success and significant failure or apparent failure, you know, and, um, so it's a it's a tough thing to want to feel like you can control life uh, because you can't. And about the only thing that you can control, I, I remember hearing, and I don't know who actually in, initiated it, but I remember hearing one pastor uh, on the radio one time say, I'm absolutely convinced that life is 5% what happens to me and 95% how I react to it. How are you react? And you know, and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of truth to that. And the the Buddhists have a, a lovely uh concept where they have they talk about being detached, being a detached observer, which means you're not always doing the Gary Larson thing where it's uh where you're reacting to everything. And and I think there's a lot of spiritual truth and beauty in trying to observe things that happen without always feeling like you have to react to them. Uh, There's a difference between reaction and response. A response is purposeful. It's thought out. A reaction is kind of a knee jerk thing. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, that, that makes sense. I've done both. I'm guilty of both. <laughs> aren't we all? Aren't we all? And, and, and that's where the really good personal question comes in. So people go, Huh, he's not as cool as I thought. And I go, yeah, I succeeded. There you go. That's right. That's right. And and none of us, none of us are, you know, as perfect as the pedestals that we're placed upon. And we're often placed upon, especially when we're willing to live out loud and, and be out front and be bold. We are placed upon pedestals because people see us for this, you know, half hour or whatever. Uh -huh. And then it just doesn't, it just doesn't translate when you get to know everyday life. Look, we all stumble is, and there, fall. There's no pedestal at home. <laughs> yeah exactly there's no not, pedestal at home not even yeah. the dog oh. puts me on a pedestal <laughs> well the dog will kick you out of the kick kick the pedestal here. out from under you in no time flat oh, so. no, here, he comes. here he comes big dog <laughs> big this dog giant english mastiff so hey we we've, we've gone about a half an hour already can you believe it so i wanted to bring up this one last photo or painting <laughs> Back, Zeus. Back. So this is the laughing Jesus. So we go from Calvary to the laughing Jesus. Like, yeah. talk about two completely different images of Christ. Well, Just, wow. You know, I think if, uh, I mean, I've got a lot of respect for uh, Christian counseling and, you know, and psychologists and, I guess, psychiatry, but... You know, a lot of times it, it seems like from everything I've read, it boils down to after they have spent a lot of time with somebody, uh, ultimately they say what Jesus said, which is be not anxious and be not afraid. 
and be of good cheer, which is kind of a weird thing. It's like, you know, it's not exactly don't worry, be happy, but, you know, to have a good sense of humor. You know, there's a, I read something in one place uh, and it said, humor is the divine antidote for exaltation of ego. I thought that was pretty significant, the way that was written. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's absurd not to think that humor is commensurate with a, a fun, loving relationship with God. Uh, my grandmother on my dad's side was a very sour, very sour woman. And, you know, she was, uh, you know, she just had a different vision of how to act holy and, you know, so her prayers always had these and thou's and, you know, that phone up. I did. But my grandside, she was more of a partier, you know, I mean, she's a, she's an awesome little Baptist chick and, you know, she enjoyed she had fun with God. She liked God. And, and there was something about that that made me, it was very magnetic to me because it's like, yeah, I like the idea of liking God. Uh, I just, because of Calvary, I, I don't know, I got a couple of hundred new friends this last week on Facebook. And one of them is, uh, you know, a nice guy. I don't remember where he is from Africa, but, but he helps run an orphanage. And he was talking about, trying to help raise them so that they would grow up with the fear of God. And I, and I said something back. I said, don't you think they might be more effective in the community if they loved God instead of were afraid of him? And, uh, you know, I don't think that anyone has a real spiritual conversion if they choose God out of fear. I don't think it's possible. I could be wrong, but. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. So, you know. Well, so um, is time up? Are we? Time is never, up. You oh. never asked What's me a personal up? question. I'm so offended. Oh, I did, but no, so you no, don't no. find you don't find the questions about your support of your family, your no. father personal. Oh no, a personal question is something you think, oh my God, he'd never answer that because he'd be embarrassed. Okay, so so do you sit down with a glass of wine every night? that <laughs> uh, I had no idea <laughs> well not always what but other, what not, other personal not, questions would there be I don't uh, I know I've got a lot of Christian friends who've had uh, a lot of struggles with alcohol and for them uh, it's just wrong uh, and and that's okay I mean people have addictions to food people have addictions to all kinds of stuff Um uh, I don't have a very addictive personality. I'm addicted to oxygen, food, water. I mean, you know, see, it's hard I, to come up with an I'm embarrassing, clip, but I'm just, I enjoy, how do you say this? I enjoy a buzz. I mean, there I think, you go. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it's, it's a refreshing change. It was one of the things that I, did on purpose because being a very work driven uh, person, I could work too much. And, and for me, it was like, if I had a glass of wine, it's like, okay, work's over because I would never paint. I'd never do a portrait, never do. It was just like, that was my dividing line. It was like, okay, I'm on break. So yeah, it's okay with me, but I understand. Were that. you ever a smoker? Or anything like that? Uh, well, yeah, I was raised in Kentucky, as you might know, and it was almost against the law not to smoke. <laughs> so I had my first cigarette. I had my first cigarette in seventh grade. Uh, never became a heavy smoker, um, but I'm really glad I don't smoke anymore. I haven't. Uh, I haven't smoked cigarettes in in decades. Uh, I mean, I was with a friend. Well, I mean, one of the most fun times I smoked a cigarette after I quit smoking was when I uh, went to China to do uh, the painting, um, uh, The Forbidden City. And, uh, 
And, and so the people that were hosting us, it was a communist Chinese orphanage. And so the guy in charge of the orphanage was a military guy. And so when we all came in, there were doctors and, and social workers and kids that were athletic and one goofy artist, you know, and a bunch of other, everybody had a, a, a talent that they were bringing to it. And, and so, you know, this Chinese, uh, military guy starts offering people cigarettes sitting around this big table and everybody's just being also Christian. It's like, he came around and it's like, give me that thing, man. I fired up. I smoked with him and drank with him. And, you know, I mean, I'd go to restaurants and, and I'd leave my group of Christian friends. I'd go sit down with people and I had no idea what they were saying. I had no idea what they offered me to eat. I have no idea, but, but, you know, I mean, um, as Jesus said, it's not what goes in man's mouth that defiles him. It's what comes out. And I think there's great truth in that. And so, you know, I was in a different culture and I wanted to be respectful and respond in a loving way. And to me, that was like, uh, that was the loving way to do it. So I did it and I had a blast. Well, there you go. There's something about your life I didn't know. <laughs> oh, there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot. I'm sure there's tons. So, see, you have all these embarrassing things that you know about, but nobody else knows about. So, how are we supposed to come up with questions for you? And how are we supposed to come up with these questions? You had 24 <laughs> hours, <laughs> didn't you? You're gonna have to give me more time than that. I guess we'll have to have you back again. There's okay. so much more no. that I want to ask you about. I mean, you you I do street art. You do. People. I don't want to. I don't want to survive an interview. Uh, as having gotten away with all the easy stuff. I mean, life's hard. And uh, I think the closer you get to God, the more might be expected of you and the more difficult your life might become. And it's hard enough for people that hate God. But there's a different kind of trial and tribulation for people. It's kind of like going to the Olympics, you know? I mean... Has any great athlete ever gone to the Olympics wanting to get a bronze medal? No. no. Everybody goes for the gold. And, and I'm thinking, if you're serious about having a relationship with God, you should treat him as a coach. You should say, I want the gold medal. And then you wait and watch him kick your butt. <laughs> like, you really want a gold medal? Okay. And, you know, I don't even care if I make it on the podium at the end of this life. I just want to know who my coach is. I want to know that I did my best. I don't care that somebody did better than me. It's all relative anyway in eternity, right? It's, it's about finishing the race, isn't it? It's about staying in to the end of the race. Uh, yeah. So you know, you know if there's a scripture out there that says that the prize goes to the person who finishes the race, it ain't going to be a pretty race. Well, what is it uh... – I mean, Paul's not my favorite guy, but I think he was pretty cool. I mean, he said, I fought a good fight. What was that? But it was lovely. I mean, it was really, you know, it was really nice. So, yeah, I'm in agreement. Press on you to the high calling. Way. What's that? I said, you look really pretty tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I have your um, sites that they can connect with you. And if they want a portrait done by you, we'd even talk about portraits. You do portraits of people. Um, yeah. What else do you do? Just real quick, what else do you do that people could, you get a blog so they can read what you're writing. You're yeah, writing. Is I'm not a good blogger though. I, my brother told me about blogs like 15 years ago. And I don't know. I just don't feel like I have that much to say on a regular basis. It just seems like you'd be so annoying to always have something to say. You're, uh, you're, you have something to say every day, but it comes through on your art. Don't worry about the words. You keep yeah. doing the art. You keep sharing you and what God's placed in you with the world and be boldly you. That's all uh, we can ask for. Words. Words. It's it like sure they is. say, if your work speaks for itself, don't interrupt. Which leads into better to be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. So <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll let my art speak for me so I look better than I am. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today on Be Bold You interview live with Cindy Lou. 
I really appreciate that you have done this interview with me and I will work on some of those questions and I'll have you back and I'll just have all those kind of questions. I'll be talking to your wife and your children to get the scoop on the questions I should be asking. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else you want to say to the world? Uh, well. I'm actually going to read what you wrote. Because you, you, when I asked you that, um, and I love this, when I asked, is there anything else that you wanted to know on the uh, pre-interview questionnaire that I do, you wrote, with no tangible proof, I am absolutely convinced and know that God is real. While I know my limited finite knowledge cannot possibly comprehend God, I know from the life of Jesus how God would act and treat others if God was human. And I couldn't have said it any better. And it's totally what I believe that we're here to be Christ to the world and to show that love of God to people and to be as human as we can be yet filled with the power of God. So thank you for that revelation for me. So we shall see you all the next time. I think uh, my next interview is in a few days, and it's with your daughter, Fanta. Oh, cool. So all the family is happening. <laughs> all right. Thank all you. Right. All right. You hang up first.